Well, good evening and thanks for coming. Welcome to this Forum for European Philosophy event on what can we learn from suffering. You'll notice that the panel isn't exactly as advertised, so let's begin with those who are here. Um, Tom Stern is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at UCL and Tasia Scratton is Associate Professor in Philosophy and Religion at the University of Leeds. Uh, Daniel Sands has been promoted to panellist. She is a um, lecturer in comparative literature at uh, Royal Holloway. Um, and I teach in the philosophy department here at LSE. Um, so we're going to be in, um, Tom, with you. Um, each of the panellists is going to say a little bit about uh, their take on this topic. Um, we're going to have some discussion among the panel, and then I'm going to throw it open once or twice, take some, some audience questions. Um, so, Tom, what can we learn from suffering? Um, thanks very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to say something at the very beginning about the relationship between suffering and philosophy in general, which struck me when I was preparing, and then I'm going to have a go at that question up there. Uh, the thing I wanted to say about suffering and philosophy in general is this. Um, I think there's a plausible case to be made that the very fact that we do philosophy at all uh, is the result of a certain kind of suffering. Um, so you might say if everything were perfect, uh, if we didn't have any questions that we really had, burning questions that we had, if there was something that we didn't, nothing that we didn't feel we understood or no way in which we didn't quite feel right in the world, um, I suspect we wouldn't do this. Uh, so I, I don't know what your idea of heaven is, but, you know, it's, it's a bit like, uh, you know, one idea about what heaven was like was that it would be like uh, flying around the face of God screaming hallelujah. <laughs> You know, it's not it's not philosophy, right? It's not um, it's not this. So, so it seems appropriate to be talking about it among philosophers. Um, the, the other side of that coin, though, it seems to me, is that if you're able to do philosophy, if you're able to have this kind of reflective discussion that hopefully we're going to have, uh, you can't be suffering too much. Um, it's a luxury and a leisure of a certain kind, and so. The fact that we've been doing this suggests a certain kind of in-between stasis. We're neither suffering too much, n nor are we completely free from it. Um, that, I hope you'll forgive me, is just a very general reflection on the, the fact of having the conversation at all. Um, as, as regards the specific question, I'm just going to go through it a little bit and try and figure out w what I think is going on in it. And then I'm going to say one or two things which come more from my area of specialisation. So... You know, the question that I was asked to think about, prepare some comments on, was can we learn from suffering? And the thing that struck me about that is that, uh, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that, that can't be the question. I mean, I mean uh, when I was a child, uh, uh, somebody... I was going through a door and somebody slammed the door as I was going through the door and I put out my hand to stop the door and the door had a glass pane in it and my hand went straight through the door. Uh, I've still got a scar. I have never since then tried to... Uh, stop a slamming door using the window pane of the, the using the pane of the door. You know, I obviously learnt something from that. The, it can't be. Can we learn? Of course, we learn. Um, and, um, but you might be asking, or, or the thing that might be bothering us about this, because there is something bothering us about this. I take it is, uh, do we always learn from suffering? Um, is there suffering that we don't learn from? And there, I suppose, I think the answer is, well, of course there is. Um, of course there's suffering that w we, we don't learn anything from. The, 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 um, that, that, that doesn't seem like um, the question is, well, it's, that's the view I come in with. I mean, it seems like obviously there's suffering that we can't possibly learn from. Um, I, mean, I suppose you might say every experience is something that we learn. So you might say, well, when you suffer, w at least you're learning in the kind of um, empty, sort of inane sense that you're having a new experience. But I think people want to think that there's something special about suffering, that that's something you learn from suffering perhaps that you wouldn't learn any other way or perhaps something that you learn from suffering that you learn more quickly uh, uh, it gives you a special access of some kind um, and that, so that seems to me to be the thing that, that we're 
that we're wondering about. And in fact, I uh, and I know that there's some more discussion of this coming, so, so, so I'll allow myself to say it more emphatically. It seems to me that the, that the, that the expectation or the, the hope or the, the command, if you like, that people who are suffering ought to be able to learn from it or ought to be able to develop something from it or ought to have some special access or new experience, um, that's potentially quite an unpleasant demand to have if you're somebody who's suffering. I mean, uh, a, a good example of this you find is among people who talk about um, being ill, having medical conditions which aren't curable, um, the language of fight, the language of um, being a warrior against a certain kind of disease. Uh, one of my favourite, um, you know the satirical magazine The Onion, one of my favourite headlines in The Onion was, um, cowardly man loses battle with cancer. Right. I mean, it, 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 uh, you know, because the language is always um, brave person, but it's the language of battle. And it's not particularly nice to be put in a situation where you're in a battle, which you're going to lose, and then to be told you've got to fight it. I mean, you're going to... That pressure seems to me to be... So the idea that you ought to be learning from this, I mean, maybe it would be nice just to think, you know, you don't, you don't have to. Um, maybe we don't. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's easier not to have that story. Um, about it and it's that idea of having a story about suffering which forms the last part of what I want to say in my sort of introductory comments as I said I'm going to say a little bit about uh, how I might approach this from my own uh, perspective and a lot of the work that I do in philosophy is history of philosophy and a lot of it's based in 19th century German discussions that's, that's kind of what I've been reading a lot recently so it's not surprising that I would bring that uh, here today um, in in the in the late half in the last half of the 19th century in german speaking lands there was what came to be known as the pessimism dispute and the pessimism dispute was basically uh, re- something which revolved around the question um, is it really worth it to be alive so it was is life worth living and it was a real sort of serious philosophical discussion that took place um, and the reason that it started was because a particular philosopher, Schopenhauer, uh, basically made an argument. The answer to which the answer to the question was no. Um, he, 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 he made an argument which it's not worth living, and essentially his argument was suffering. That was his argument. It was suffering is all pervasive. Suffering is unavoidable, and suffering can't be learnt from. You, you, you know, the, it, of course, there are instances like me in the window where I. But at the deep level, if you just look at most people, they're suffering in a way that they don't learn from, and that, that was his analysis. And so there are people who think that. One of my favourite responses to that, and that's the response I'll just end with, say a little bit about and end with, um, for, as my introduction uh, to the discussion, was, was Nietzsche's. Nietzsche's response to this, at least in part, was to measure our lives by how much we suffer or how much we don't suffer, or even to measure our lives by how much we learn from suffering and how much we don't learn from suffering. That's the wrong measure. What's, what's, what's interesting about us, he said, was not whether we learn from it, so whether we learn new facts or experiences or abilities. What's interesting to us is whether we have the right story about it. So, um, you know, for example, uh, if you imagine an athlete, how much an athlete suffers, uh, imagine an athlete in the middle of a training session suffering as much as they possibly, as much as they do, right? I imagine, I have no idea, right? but anyway, imagine, and now imagine me who does no exercise suddenly walking along the street and just for no reason at all having the kind of pains that presumably an athlete has, or even having half the amount of pain if you can say that about pain. You know, I would probably be more distressed about the pain that I was experiencing than the athlete would be about the, the pain that she was experiencing because she's got a story about what she's doing. She's training, she's working towards something, there's something coming out of it, she knows why it's happening, all those sorts of things. And I guess the thing I wanted to say about the idea of having a story or a meaning for your suffering is it can be false. Um, it can be ludicrous. It can be something that everybody else knows is not the case. It doesn't need to be a kind of learning at all. Um, not where learning tracks something true. You, you, know, you might have a quack doctor who tells you you need to do a certain kind of dance three times a day, uh, otherwise you'll suffer, and then you fail to do the dance, and then you suffer, and you might think, of course, it's got nothing to do with anything. The, the dance was a, an imaginary cause, but having a meaning or a story is different from having learning. So maybe the thing we need to think about is not just can we learn from this, but what kind of stories do we tell ourselves? And... 
Um, I think that's a good place to stop, as far as I understand it, because I think the next the next part will be a little bit about that in one way or another. So thank you all for listening. Yeah, yeah. thank you very very much. That's really interesting and. Um, it's amazing how many overlaps there are um, between the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, you've talked quite generally about suffering, and my own research is uh, on a particular kind of suffering, is on depression, which, of course, has a very strong association uh, with suffering. Um, if someone isn't suffering, then they probably don't have depression. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I'm really interested in is religious and spiritual interpretations of depression, um, and how those interpretations will shape the experience and change the experience of depression itself. Um, and those interpretations are quite wide-ranging. So, for example, you get some, some Christians who say, um, oh, depression is a sin or a symptom of sin or of demonic possession. Um, you get people at the other end of the spectrum who say um, depression is a sign of closeness or holiness, um, closeness to God, um, a kind of dark night of the soul or something like that. And then you get, get um, interpretations that reject those kind of supernatural stories about depression and they tell more naturalistic stories. So um, they, they would kind of agree with um, most, most medical interpretations that the causes are psychological or they're social or they're biological. But they say what's really important is they're potentially transformative. So, so good things can come out of them. Um, there can be beneficial things or people can learn from them. And I think that really fits with the, the idea of um, having a story about suffering that, that gives the, the suffering itself meaning. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of examples that people who've had depression give of the sorts of things that they say um, that they've learned from that experience. Um, and I want to focus on three themes particularly, which seem to me to come up time and time again in the, in the narratives of depression recovery. Um, and those are compassion, um, acceptance of the self, and also appreciation of beauty. Um, so when people talk about, often talk about developing compassion as a result of having experienced depression, um, and they they mean different things by that, or there tend to be different aspects that they then go on to talk about. Um, so one of those aspects is uh, compassion in the very literal sense. Compassion means feeling with um, or suffering with. And people will sometimes say, well, as a, as a result of having experienced depression myself, I don't remain unaffected by other people's sufferings. I'm, I can feel what they are feeling, or I can feel something very much like it because I'm reminded of my own experience. So a sort of sense of having insight into the feeling of others. Um, a kind of a kind of additional sense or, or an extra intelligence that comes out of it. Another sense in which people talk about compassion is that they they say, well, as a result of depression, I feel more mo motivated um, to help others, and that's because I've kind of lost my fear of crisis, or I've become more courageous. Um, and that, of course, is really really significant because people who are depressed. Um, or have various other kinds of illness uh, are often people that other people are, are, fri are frightened of. They don't know how to interact with them. And so it's really important if someone's sort of got, got courage in order to become involved and to be with the person and to help the person and so on. That's a very, very powerful thing. Um, so two people who, who talk about this, one of them is uh, the writer and activist Andrew Solomon, uh, and in his great book, The Noonday Demon, which is about his and others' experience of depression, he writes that if you have been through such a thing, you cannot watch it unfold in the life of someone without feeling horrified. It's easier for me in many ways to plunge myself into the sorrow of others than it is for me to watch the sorrow and stay out of it. Not interfering is like watching someone spill good wine all over the dinner table. It's easier to turn the bottle upright and wipe up the puddle than it is to ignore what's going on. Um, and Parker Palmer, who's a Quaker activist and writer, uh, writes about something similar, but he uses the language of courage. 
So he says, once you've survived depression, you can say to yourself, what could be more daunting than that? I survived depression, so the challenge in front of me right now doesn't seem all that fearsome. And he gives various examples here. One of the examples he actually gives is coming and talking to a room full of people. Um, so I knew how he felt just before I got in here. Um, but he also talks about the courage to kind of be with people when, when they're depressed. Um, and that having, having had depression himself, he doesn't feel the fear um, that other people fe feel um, because he's a kind of more courageous person. So that's that's the um, sorry the the third way in which compassion uh, is often talked about uh, is in a very practical way knowing how to help knowing what kind of advice to give um, and the 14th century humanist Petrarch talks quite a lot about this um, and this is of course something um, that was taken up later in the in the Jungian idea of the wounded healer the idea that it's only uh, the wounded physician who can heal because it's only only the person who is wounded in a particular way who knows what kind of advice or what kind of help to give to people. Um, so although all of those are talked about as compassion, um, there's sort of three separate senses or three separate aspects of that. In addition to compassion, um, self-acceptance is quite a big theme in these depression recovery narratives. Um, so the idea of being happier with oneself, happier in one's relationships to others, uh, is something that crops up time and again uh, with depression. And some people will even go as far as to speak of depression as a kind of alarm um, of sorts because something wasn't right in their own self-understanding or there was some aspect to themselves they didn't accept properly um, and they couldn't have good relations to others as a result of that. Um, but even if they don't think that, even if they have a, even say a, an entirely biological understanding of why they got depressed, nevertheless they find sometimes that afterwards they are, um, they are happier with themselves, they're happier in their relationship to others. So Henri now and the Dutch Roman Catholic priest uh, writes um, following his experience of depression, and these accounts are nearly all um, after the experience of depression. So what you said about we can't be suffering too much uh, at the time to do philosophy seems right. These are um, accounts that are kind of reflecting on the experience after the worst of it is over. Uh, Henri now and writes, looking back, that reading my journal of depression makes me aware of the radical changes I've undergone. I've moved from anguish to freedom, through depression to peace, through despair to hope. My depression certainly was a time of purification for me. My heart, ever questioning my goodness, value and worth, has become anchored in a deeper love and thus less dependent on the praise and blame of those around me. It has also grown into a greater ability to give love, without always expecting love in return. <clears throat> and finally, a theme that crops up um, often in the depression recovery accounts um, that I don't think gets recognized enough in the literature that talks about it uh, is aesthetic appreciation and especially appreciation of natural beauty. So it's really interesting in these accounts uh, that one of the things that people will note following their experience of depression is how beautiful the natural world looks. And they'll often say, I'd never really noticed it that much before. Um, so one person in an, an unpublished account uh, says that following the death of her husband, the shock and deep depression took some years to live through. But gradually my mind became conscious of a more acute sense of the beauties that were around us and a thankfulness of which I was not aware before. And Vincent van Gogh as well writes um, to his friend Emile Bernard who's experiencing melancholy uh, and he's giving advice because he himself has suffered melancholy, what, what depression used to be called. And he says, what I wanted to say is this, after the period of melancholy is over, you will be stronger than before. You will recover your health, and you will find the scenery around you so beautiful that you will want to do nothing but paint. So this really strong sense that following depression, people can have um, an appreciation of beauty. And it's interesting, but kind of strange, that actually it's natural beauty. It's nearly always natural beauty that people talk about. 
so that's kind of some of the ways in which um, people recount their own experiences of depression and the benefits that come from it and the things that they learn from it. There are sceptics who raise objections to these kinds of accounts. Um, so I'd like to kind of consider some of the things that they say, um, and I would be really interested in knowing everyone's responses and thoughts about them. So some sceptics say, well, people are kind of primed to say these things. Um, there are certain cultural memes about suffering, in the same way that there are cultural memes about something like cancer, that it's a battle. There's also the cultural memes, say, of the wounded healer in relation to depression. And so they say we, sh we shouldn't take it too seriously. People are kind of socialized to say these kinds of things if they've had these experiences. There are, there are tests that are designed to get around that kind of thing. So there's a test that um, asks people to report um, how much they experience, say, compassion or how much they experience um, aesthetic beauty. And rather than asking at the beginning whether they've had depression, they ask the question at the end. So the idea is that the person isn't primed to think, ah, yes, I had this experience, I must be a wounded healer, or something like that. They, they recount their, ex their um, experience more truthfully and then at the end say whether they've had depression or not. And those kinds of tests do seem to suggest that, at least in as far as we can trust self-reports, um, which is, it's not clear to what extent we can, but at least in as far as we can, people who've experienced things like depression do tend to have these kinds of benefits, <coughs> more, more compassion, um, relatively more appreciation of beauty, and so on. So that, that seems to be one way of, of responding to those kinds of concerns. Another, another set of concerns says, well, these are, these are kind of consolatory. If these people have had really bad experiences for significant chunks of their life, then they want to report something good that's come out of it precisely to feel better about that kind of experience. Um, but that doesn't reflect the reality of the matter. Or alternatively, they're feeling great. They're feeling really, really elated and really optimistic because they're no longer depressed. And that gives them a kind of rose-tinted uh, perspective on, on their previous experience. And I don't think it's very easy to kind of um, uh, negate those kinds of accounts. It's not easy to prove them wrong. Um, but it seems to me that it's applying more skepticism um, to experiences of depression than we would normally apply to people's reports of their experiences. And there's no reason to be that skeptical. Um, there's no reason to kind of um, uh, question everyone's report of their experience. So, so I don't know about, about you, but I'm not so convinced by those kinds of objections. Um, there's another kind of objection, though, uh, which again fits in with some of the things uh, that Tom says, and that, that objection or set of objections is not so much to do with whether these accounts are truthful, whether they're true to the experience or not, um, whether they're realistic, but more to do with whether they're helpful, whether it's a helpful thing to say um, you can learn from your experiences of suffering. And some people think, well, no, it's not really helpful. It can lead to really glib, insensitive responses to suffering. Uh, kind of, it could lead you. It could lead someone to say, um, "Oh, well, I'm sorry you're feeling depressed, but never mind. You'll become more compassionate, and it will all be all right." Um, that's not a good good thing to say to people, by the way. Um, or not like that, anyway. Um, <clears throat> So someone t tells this account of a preacher at a baby's funeral, and the pre this is a true story. The, the, um, the preacher says, well, the baby's death was caused in order to get the church community to reflect on the brevity of life and so repent and, and rededicate themselves to the faith. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the parents and the family of the baby were very, very upset by this sermon, and they didn't go back to the church. Um, so this is one of the th ways in which these kinds of um, accounts of things can be used badly, can be used to kind of give glib, insensitive responses to people's suffering, um, 
or equally as as Tom highlighted it can put pressure on people to to feel they ought to be developing morally whereas when they're depressed possibly all they can do is is survive all they can do is kind of get by day by day uh, in which case it's not a good pressure to put on people and I think those are very important and, and valid concerns to have about this. Um, on the other hand, I, in some contexts, people seem to find it very helpful to have these kind of examples of people who've benefited quite a lot and who've learned and gained from their experience of depression because they think, well, this gives me a kind of hope. This, this tells me that this experience isn't just a horrible experience but that some good can come out of it. Um, so again, I'd be interested to hear what other people think, but it seems to me that this is a matter of judging in what context it's good to talk about these things and how to talk about them, uh, rather than saying um, we shouldn't talk about them whatsoever. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> now, Danielle, you didn't know you were going to be a panelist till about an, uh, an hour ago. Um, I think even less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we found out Harvey's train was unfortunately cancelled. Um, is there anything you'd like to say in response to some of that? Yeah, so I'm not going to give a kind of structured response in the, the way these guys have so eloquently done. But I thought one of the things that it might be interesting to do is um, to kind of let you know a little bit about what I was thinking when I originally thought about this event, which was way back in spring or summer this year. And the thing that triggered me to organise this event was I was reading Zizek. Um, and there's this passage in Zizek where he says... Um, the worst thing about suffering is that we don't learn anything from it. Um, the only thing we learn is that it's really, really important to avoid it. <laughs> and the example he gives is um, people who've lived through very extreme um, suffering, so victims of war, of torture. Um, and he was saying there is no evidence that people who've experienced such extreme suffering um, then cease causing suffering to other people. Often they replicate these same models of suffering. Um, so the idea that suffering makes us more compassionate, more empathetic, he would say, is a myth. Um, now, this is really problematic if it's true, because I think one of the things we do as philosophers is try and construct some kind of frameworks of the formation of meaning. Um, and one of the things we do as human beings, more, more importantly. Um, so, so reading Zizek kind of stopped me in my tracks, and I really wanted to ask whether this is true or not, whether really the, the, the claim that we do construct meaning or we become better people or we become more compassionate people when we've suffered, um, whether it's true or whether it's simply a myth. Um, and whether, in fact, suffering just makes us more selfish because we so desperately, the more we suffer, the more desperately we want to avoid that kind of suffering. Um, and the more we kind of block our ears to the noise of other people suffering. So I think I'm still not sure which is true, and I think it depends on the degree of suffering and the type of suffering that we've experienced. Um, and I, he also talks about the need to avoid this idea that suffering is redemptive in some way, and this is what you were gesturing towards, that the idea that it can be so offensive and, and misguided to try and reclaim suffering in some way, to say that it's okay because... Um, you learn something or you'll be rewarded in heaven or some any kind of either earthly or unearthly kind of redemptive narrative um, because the problem with those kinds of narratives are they seem to cause us make us more likely to accept our own suffering they seem to make it more likely that we'll accept other people's suffering um, and perhaps even propagate suffering so if we think that there will be some kind of Reward somewhere in some way, surely this diminishes the pain that uh, suffering causes. Um, and I suppose the question I, I don't have the answer to is how can we still retain the idea that suffering has some kind of value or we can learn some, something from it without permitting it or endorsing it in some way? Um, I suppose the last thing I want to say is it's just thinking about where the philosopher fits in. So if we are thinking about kind of post-theological narratives of suffering where we don't believe that we will be rewarded for our suffering in another place or another time, um, what do we do as philosophers? Um, 
what is the task of philosophy in the face of suffering? Um, is philosophy supposed to provide a kind of consolation for suffering? Or is philosophy supposed to do the opposite? Um, I suppose I want to think about philosophy as as that which tries to face suffering without, foreclo without either foreclosing it or redeeming it in some way. And I don't quite know what that would mean. Um, but I do find it problematic when, we, when you hear people talking about philosophy as consolatory. And I know there's a philosophical history of philosophy as consolatory. Um, but I think there's some important work that philosophy does in... In, yeah, resisting either the redemption of, the, of, of suffering or the foreclosing of it. And I guess I want to ask, ask us all, what, what can we do to, to sustain philosophy in this uncomfortable position, I suppose? Because I think philosophy ought to be in an uncomfortable position. I think that's the point of philosophy, is being in an uncomfortable position. It definitely seems like a theme from a number of uh, from the things that a number of you have said, this tension between, on the one hand, acknowledging somebody's suffering and, and trying to, to redeem it. I think perhaps we can move on to talk about that. And first, but first, I'd like to take some, some audience questions, and perhaps we'll turn to that, to that topic, mm -hmm. this tension of how to acknowledge suffering um, without somehow trying to, um, or, or intention with trying to redeem it. Um, if you've got a question, could you please put your hand up and, and wait for the mic to come for, to you so that you can be on the podcast. Yes. Hey, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering whether any of you have really thought about how we could try to quantify suffering and would we, if we do want to reduce it, would we want to reduce it for those people who are suffering the most or reduce suffering for the most amount of people or... Would you say there could be a general rule in that? Good. Um, let's take a few questions in succession, if we can. I'll invite you as the panel to take up a question as you like. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. Um, well, I'm thinking of when we think of suffering, it, it depends, like you say, what suffering it is. I mean, it, when we think of the war going on in Syria or people in the camps, you know, there's a certain amount of suffering. Um, for example, when you say collateral damage uh, in war and people are just seen as collateral damage and or war crimes, you know, I mean, that, that is seen as something that, you know, we... There's a, there's a line, isn't there, where you've got to say, well, this sort of suffering is just being human and some suffering where, you know, we want justice. And, you know, so you've got to have a, a boundary where you say suffering is acceptable. I mean, there's lots of suffering uh, even coming here. You know, I've seen people on the streets. That's suffering, you know, but most people walk by. So at what point do we say suffering is acceptable suffering, you know, and okay suffering that, you know, a lot of civilizations have said, yeah, this is okay. Actually, they've, they've built their cities on suffering, you know, so it, it's just a question of how you conceptualize suffering and say, well, this is okay and this is, you know, religion has caused a lot of suffering as well, you know, so how does that tie into the bigger picture of, of suffering? So um, all those kinds of issues. Sort of how much suffering is acceptable? Um, there's a gentleman about halfway up on the right. Sorry, uh, carrying on from that, I was going to say somebody always has it worse than you have. I want to put that to the panel. Um, just carrying on from what the lady was speaking. Um, yeah, the, the so you know you always think somebody's worse, got it worse than you have from the self. Um, do you, you, that's what I said. Sorry. Good. Yeah, it's a sort of question of how to compare suffering between between people. Um, so, someone on this side of the room. I don't want to be unfair. Uh, yes, uh, at the front. Yeah, you. Uh, if you could just wait for the yeah. mic, though, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. So the panel has mentioned the kind of different, res um, different, uh, I guess, things that we could get from suffering, from compassion to wanting to replicate that suffering and that pain. So I just want to know, I guess, um, your I like your opinions or ideas on, I guess, the idea of has suf like the suffering um, have to cross a certain line for it to move on from producing compassion and kindness and sympathy. 
and between con producing, I guess, um, wanting to replicate that suffering and that pain. Good. Well, I think that gives us enough to be getting along with. Uh, so a question about how to quantify suffering, a question about how much can we accept? Is, is there a certain amount of suffering that's kind of necessary or, or justified? A question about comparing suffering, there's always somebody worse. Um, and a question really about sort of how much suffering can promote compassion, but whether you've got too much can kind of just sort of perpetuate itself. Yeah. Who would like to take us on any of these? Well, I mean, one thing I think um, applies both to what Danielle was saying and in a sense to all of these questions is I think the kind of potentially transformative account that some of these writers are putting forward um, is unlike some of the other theological accounts actually saying the suffering itself is an undesirable thing it's, it's got naturalistic causes we should never think of it as desirable um, and some good things may come of it um, but that doesn't in itself mean that the suffering is, its, is a good thing and it seems significant to me that it's only after the usually only after the event that people begin to um, make sense of their experience of depression in, in these positive terms um, so it's not that people are saying while they're experiencing depression every day I get up and I'm more compassionate or, or um, uh, I, I appreciate beauty more or whatever in fact at that time people are often sort of in a kind of darkness so that they, they precisely can't do those things or don't feel those things about themselves. Um, so it really is only after the event and it's only only when suffering has passed. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't seem to me that, that they are saying that the suffering is a good thing. Um, if anything, they're saying um, there is a reason to seek a cure, to seek healing from this specific kind of suffering um, because that's... <clears throat> Excuse me. That's when we can begin to give meaning to it. Um, I agree absolutely uh, with the points made that there are some kinds of suffering um, that um, are kind of dysteleological. They're so extreme, um, or perhaps they're not extreme, but they're everyday and incremental. And the person who experiences them internalizes the the negative attitudes. Um, that they're experiencing towards themselves. So in cases of sort of low-level abuse, that can be the case. And those don't seem to me to be cases where we would talk about something being potentially transformative. They seem to be cases um, where the suffering is 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 almost just a bad thing. Now, I don't want to, to kind of say that there are no cases, um, that there are some cases in which no one can experience good things from them because it seems to me that's um, to be to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but it does seem to me that we should continue to say suffering is negative, suffering is a bad thing, um, and certainly <coughs> extreme sorts of suffering, we shouldn't be kind of glib or romanticise it or idealise it. So I'm glad those those kinds of concerns were raised. Tom, um, I'll I'll take up just w one of those questions, um, which was the question at the front about uh, uh, basically about other people's suffering. I mean, it occurred to me during the course of that question that um, m most of our responses were about our own. I, I think maybe it's certainly true of me when I was giving my answer. It was, uh, can we learn from, can I learn from my own suffering? But I think part of the suggestion in one of the questions was, well, wh what about learning from other people's uh, suffering? And there I think we do find ourselves in one of these difficult uh, dilemmas because on the one hand uh, there's something a little bit cold or unpleasant uh, as in the case of the baby's funeral of setting out a story whereby this other being suffering is something oh well it worked out okay because I learnt from it on the other hand to learn nothing from it almost makes it seem worse 
Um, I mean, I don't particularly like the explanation that the baby died to bring the community closer together in the church, but that probably says something to do with my views about the, you know, the church, not about my views about learning from suffering. If, if it, if a medical condition that somebody suffers enables more people to learn about it to prevent it in the future, well, it doesn't seem like a, a bad case. But anyway, it just, it, it just made me think that. That, that, that learning from the suffering of others versus learning from the suffering of yourself presents a rather different challenge. So thank you for the question. I hadn't, hadn't thought about mm-hmm. it in those terms. Danielle. Yeah, a very brief response to the question at the front, which was kind of about the politics of suffering, really, um, rather than personal suffering, I suppose. And, and the question about whether we can quantify suffering. And obviously because... Suffering is to some degree subjective. It feels difficult to quantify it. Um, And I wonder whether rather than trying to quantify suffering, um, all we can do is kind of quantify the violations which cause the suffering. Um, That that seems to have a a, a more easily definable scale than the suffering in itself. Um, Because as soon as we start trying to compare the suffering itself, we end up in this very difficult problem with the subjective experience of suffering. It's interesting, Tom, you said that most of uh, the panel have been talking about our own suffering and what we can learn from our own suffering. Um, Teji, you mentioned compassion. I suppose that's very much directed at other people's suffering. Um, Mm -hmm. Is there a sense in which we as non if you're a non-sufferer and you're faced with a sufferer we want them to learn from their suffering there's a kind of social sort of pressure on people perhaps to sort of learn from their suffering because it makes non-sufferers maybe sort of feel a bit better or able to cope or more able to cope with it so the sort of pressure could be coming from both from both places um within the person wanting to kind of understand and articulate their own suffering but also perhaps this this idea that we can learn from suffering and perhaps we ought to learn from suffering as kind of social idea as well um well let's go back to that question we promised to go back to how to reconcile um on the one hand acknowledging someone's suffering um without sort of somehow trying to to redeem it um, how is it possible to reconcile those two <laughs> well I mean one of the one of the things that a lot of pastoral literature in particular points to is the importance of simply being there with someone and actually not giving advice um, but simply saying well I, I acknowledge that this suffering uh, is going on um, and I'm not, um, I'm not frightened to be around you because I think what a lot of people experience uh, when they're undergoing some kind of suffering, including depression, but other th- things, other kinds of illness and so on, is precisely this kind of alienation because people fall away because they're not quite sure what to say anymore. Um, and that, that can make the experience even more lonely than, than, it, than it is. And then the opposite of that that people often recount is is sort of very good friends who um, or people who become very good friends who are just not um, not frightened to be around that person. So Parker Palmer talks about this guy uh, during his depression. He comes every day and he gives him a foot massage. And that's all he does. He doesn't ask him. He doesn't ask him to speak or anything like that. And this kind of foot massage, which is of course he's kind of getting in touch with his his body again because the the body can seem very separate in depression um but it's also very undemanding of him it's it's a simple i i am here with you um and he kind of contrasts that that kind of experience to people who who come and say oh but parker you're such a you're such a great guy um you can't surely you need to kind of cheer up now and come for a walk with us it will make you feel better and if you did a bit more exercise and got out a bit more, maybe you would you would stop feeling depressed. So he, he kind of said, that actually, all of that advice was really, really unhelpful because it made me feel worse. But someone simply being there and not judging me for it uh, was was and acknowledging my suffering, as you say, uh, was a, a profoundly helpful experience. Um, so so that's one way in which we might consider doing that. I think. 
I mean, I think this desire to judge or this this need mm. to judge, I think it goes back to what you were saying about wanting um, the sufferer to have learned something. Mm. I think there's some strange punitive logic that we still operate <laughs> under that maybe we think people have caused their suffering in some way. So I suppose there's explicit <laughs> cases where, you know, people smoke and they get lung cancer and there's been some contributory effect um, and so the tendency is then how, how do you attribute blame do you attribute blame the person is suffering mm. clearly we can't blame somebody I mean but it's this sense that what if somebody has done something which has contributed to their suffering how do we acknowledge that suffering still I think we find it incredibly difficult to mm. be non-judgmental about um, suffering whether it's mental or physical mm, suffering, but, I think. So may I just ask, so, I mean, you might, you might imagine somebody saying, well, um, in the smoking case, sh- should I be non-judgmental about that? Right. Uh, so so, so um, now, if somebody starts smoking, I know it's not easy to stop, but if somebody starts smoking and then I judge them for the suffering, I, I, I don't judge them for the suffering, but I have a story where they did something to cause it versus somebody who gets a similar condition without having done something or not known about it. If I then, well, I don't have to judge them in the sense of going and telling them that it was all their fault, but if I come to the conclusion that theirs is a different kind of case, is, have I made have I made a mistake? It sounds like maybe you were suggesting that I have, but I... Yeah, okay. It's not a good idea to wonder out loud for a podcast whether you're just a horrible person. <laughs> anyway, um, um, I suppose what I'm doing is I'm wondering out loud whether I'm just a horrible person. And I'm asking somebody to tell me. So anyway, let's just, yeah. So, so one question... Do, sorry, do you mind if I jump in there? Of course. One question we might ask about that is whether we know for sure that um, the person who takes up smoking, whether it is, in fact, their fault, um, given that we know that some people, for example, are more prone to uh, certain kinds of... Um, things such as addiction Uh, there seem to be strong dissimilarities between people as to whether they become addicted or not so maybe the two people take up smoking because they're stressed they've had a stressful day and one person becomes addicted and the other doesn't so it's not clear even if someone does take up smoking that it is their fault um, unless one is simply uh, judging on purely on the basis of kind of external behaviours as soon as one starts to look at responsibility under the surface it becomes more complicated (laughs) Sure, so I suppose that, that, that seems absolutely right. I suppose that, I mean, assuming that we think sometimes that people... I mean, assuming we think sometimes people can do things which contribute to their own suffering in a way that we're mm-hmm. reasonably happy to uh, assert. So maybe smoking's a bad example. Maybe smoking, if I don't have all the facts, I just judge a smoker. But if I somehow were privy to those facts and I were able to tell that this was a smoker who wasn't particularly prone or just imagine a case... Um, uh, so th- th- then the question would still stand. So I can see I-, I can see I'm a bad person for judging the smoker in general. But what about the smoker who really tries, works really hard to get a- addicted, <laughs> and and has all the information and doesn't seem to be prone, and then develops a certain kind of condition, and I treat their suffering differently from how I treat somebody who's say the virtuous smoker or whatever it is. I, um, there, the question seems to me still stands that it's not obvious that I've done something wrong by treating those two things as different cases. I mean, apart from anything else, um, at least on the story I was trying to tell at the beginning, one thing you can say about those two different accounts would be something like um, the, the, the person who knows exactly why they ended up with the condition that they have has a good story about it, even if it's not a story that, you know, if it doesn't, they, they know why it is that they're suffering the thing that they're suffering. And it seems plausible to me that n- not having any idea or any plausible, by your own standards, account of why you're experiencing the suffering that you're experiencing, that, that seems to me to be the, the more difficult thing. So from that point of view, I think I could say, well, these are different these are different cases that the person who knows that they've got it because they smoked has a story that the other person doesn't and it might be better or something like that was part of your point danielle is that we're kind of on the lookout to apportion responsibility not necessarily that in some cases we aren't 
right to, but even in cases where we, we're not right to, yeah, we're on the lookout yeah. in order to somehow give, a, give somebody suffering a point. Yes, yeah, to make sense, to kind of enclose it within some kind of framework that we can understand. I right. Think. Mm. So are you actually not that far away from each other? <laughs> Both of you are saying we need some sort of framework or some kind of structure, narrative, that, mm. narrative within which we can understand. doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. But I'm going to put a I'm going to put a bid in for this being resisted. Say so this is actually one of the things I've I've written more on, which is uh, Christians talking particularly about depression as a sin or a symptom of sin. Um, so they'll say, well, this person, you know, didn't read the Bible or didn't pray enough or didn't exercise enough or or didn't socialize enough, and that was why they became depressed. Um, and of course, one could see that as as some religious people being not very nice, but it has its uh, parallel in kind of secular accounts uh, where people will say to depressed people well if you only did this differently if you're only a bit less selfish if you only did got out a bit more then you wouldn't you wouldn't have this depression and, uh, and I, I kind of think you're absolutely bang on that there's this almost this kind of um, I half think it's because people want to say this, the bad thing won't happen to me because I'm not going to make the same mistake. So it seems like a kind of distancing, a distancing thing um, that, that then we can say, well, the reason that's happened to you is because you did this bad thing. And, and so it protects the self a little bit. And I really think that needs to be resisted just because it's so unhelpful to the people who experience it. Um, and it, it, time and time again, at least in depression, it seems to add this sort of extra burden and this extra layer of kind of guilt and feeling bad about the self. Um, so I, so I, guess, I guess my answer to this is, yes, it's a story, um, but it's a bad story. Like, it's a really, really unhelpful story. Um, and um, maybe, maybe it is the case that there is a level of responsibility in some people's bad luck, if I can use the word luck if it's slightly their responsibility. Um, but even if there is, it doesn't seem to matter. It kind of, it doesn't really seem to help the situation to start apportioning blame. So, so kind of why would we do it anyway? Um, where would it get us to do that, I guess? Yeah. Well, I, um, yes, it, it, it seems absolutely right that you might have a, you might have a bad story and... And I think it's an interesting question: what what would count as a bad story or a good story? So, so it seems to me like it, it, it's not a bad story just because it's a false story. Because I could imagine somebody being told a story that would make them feel a lot better, even though it wasn't true. Um, it seems to be a bad story because it makes people f feel worse, or it reinforces mm. the condition, or it makes them. It, it actually it actually makes the underlying thing. W worse, I suppose. I I'd be interested to know what I don't know what people say in these contexts. But um, is it better to be told, or would it be better as a sufferer of depression to be told um, if this is true? Uh, this is just really, really bad luck, and there's absolutely nothing you can do, or there's only a very limited number of things you can do. We really don't have any idea at all why it's happening, and. You know, there are just kind of unpleasant brute facts, and you're in one. I mean, is is that? <coughs> I'm not suggesting one should say that to somebody, but if one were to hear that message, the kind of no story story, if you mm -hmm. like, is that an improvement on the bad story, or or not? I don't know what people mm -hmm. would. I don't know how people would experience it. My my instinct is that some people would find that extremely helpful, and some people would find that extremely unpleasant. But I don't have a uh, I don't have a yeah an idea really. Is there a difference on you, your, your view uh, between pointing to the cause of the suffering and in a, in a sense pointing to its meaning? Because there's one it's one thing saying well the reason you've got such and such a condition or suffering in such and such a way is because X happened, which could be quite a naturalistic cause. You started smoking, or mm. you were in a car crash, or whatever it was. Something very very naturalistic, um, but that's not yet to give it a meaning doesn't really give it a narrative within which the suffering makes sense because it doesn't give you some reasons why in a sense it ought to happen or um, it doesn't really help you understand what you could potentially learn from it. it just tells you why it's happened 
Yeah, I suppose. I suppose when I'm talking about, when we talk about meaning or 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 or, or, a, or, a, or a story, I suppose there's a number of different elements you might want to think about. One is the cause. I do think that's important to people. Um, just even you know, n- naming a condition is supposed to be alle- alleviating sometimes. Just knowing what it's called. Um, another thing might be that it's related to something you've done. Um, that might be something that would give it meaning. So um, because you did X, Y, and Z, you're in this situation. Now, that might not be a way out of it, but it might at least give it... You would at least be able to have a relate it to things that you've chosen. That might be something. And then something you can do about it, or something that you think you can do about it, or something that you can do in relation to it might be part of a meaning. So those those three different things might all be, and I suppose maybe ideally you'd want all of them. You'd want the cause, you'd want the cause to be something you'd chosen and the, the response to be something you could do. But, um, yeah, that, that's what it seems to me to be like, anyway. I'm interested in this idea that it's not just the person who's experiencing the suffering who needs a story, it's the person who perceives the suffering who also seems to mm. need a story. And the extent to which we should allow the person perceiving the suffering any intervention on the dictating the story because mm. it seems like we need to build stories around the suffering we perceive in others but that can be invasive or problematic or appropriative <coughs> um, and can we balance those needs I suppose it's a bit like Tej your example of the seeing the bottle of wine spilling on the table as somebody watching it even if it's not my table you know it's still it's just overwhelming kind of compulsion to sort of you know if you can see it spilling to try to do something about it uh, um, and so yeah the experience of somebody who isn't suffering is also maybe something that maybe needs philosophical thought maybe mm. more, most reflection has been on the experience of the person themselves with the exception mm. of compassion I suppose yeah which seems to involve the suffering of both yeah yeah mm. Well, let's throw it open uh, once again for some uh, questions. Uh, please raise your hand. Yes, Catherine, please wait for the mic if you can. Okay, well, listening to you, it was absolutely fascinating how you are thinking within the Christian framework. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking of two main philosophical traditions, Stoicism and Buddhism, where... Suffering has no meaning whatsoever. It's the abyss. But we can learn to master it, to overcome it in some ways. There are lots of techniques and attitudes you could develop and become a better human being, become different, and learn in that sense practically, not so. There's no meaning whatsoever, but the way you fight it makes you more human. What do you think of that? Thanks. Would somebody like to respond to that straight away? I I wonder if we've been reading different Stoics, um, because my my understanding is much more that, at least according to some of them, there's a sort of rational order to the universe, and suffering plays a part in a rational story, which we can't tell, but could be told by somebody else. And that seems to me like a kind of pretty good candidate for a for a story, for a good story. I mean, I'd much rather believe that than what I actually believe, which is it's just all a big mess. Um, I'd much rather think that the Stoics are right than than that. So, so uh, yeah, I I, um, I don't know about that. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's funny. I mean, Stoicism is the recognition of the absurdity of it. There's nothing you can do about it, but you can change yourself. You sh- can change your attitude toward this well, dreadful situation, dreadful suffering. I, I mean, um, I suppose, yeah, so in a way what I'm saying is that there's nothing you can do about it, but you can change yourself. The, the changing yourself is the, is the doing. Yes. And it's not by any means obvious to me that that's always the case. It seems to me that part of what suffering might involve is not being able to... Mm. change yourself or or being told that you can change yourself to, to, to continue with one of the I think what's become one of the themes that uh, that might be a story that's imposed on you that you 
you resent. I mean, I'm not sure I can change myself in the relevant ways. So it seems to me like the Stoics are optimists in in a way that I'm not. That they're more hopeful than I am. But that's all I can. Remember Camus. I mean, Albert Camus uh, mentioned the myth of Sisyphus. I mean, Sisyphus myth, saying, "Well, you have to accept this." dreadful situation where there's no meaning whatsoever, but you carry on because you change yourself. I mean, your attitude, you, you are mastering something. So you learn to master suffering, but you don't learn from suffering. We're going to take uh, a few more uh, questions. Let's take uh, a few in a row because I can see lots of hands. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, right at the back in the corner. Hello, thanks for everything so far. It's been super interesting. Um, so, a bit of a strange question. If you um, were suddenly bereaved, would you um, opt to take a tablet immediately that would remove all of your feelings of suffering straight away? Great, thank you for a very succinct question. Brilliant. Um, who, there were lots of other hands. Uh, yeah, there's a lady uh, here. And if you can be as brief as that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so this kind of goes back to the question that was just asked, and it might kind of tie in. Um, should there be an exploration of the actual duration or prolongation of suffering and the quantification of the learning that comes from it? Um, so if the longer the suffering, should there be more learning? Okay. <laughs> yes. Just wait for the mic and then... Hi, um, I wanted to ask is, um, do you think religions are good enough reason to justify suffering? And like, what religious perspectives do you agree with the most in regards to suffering? Like, obviously, like, I learned that um, Buddhists believe it's probably vital, like some may argue that is, and then obviously you said Christianity believes that it's a sin, so which one do you think is the most right, and can it be justified? Right, thank you. Uh, let's take uh, one <laughs> further question. Uh, in the middle, in white. Um, okay. If you just wait for the mic, uh, that would be marvellous. Um, I was just going to ask if you think scepticism towards suffering diminishes people's effort to go through it, and how, in the case of depression, the idea that um, if you learn from it and if you have compassion afterwards, it's sort of like, oh, I had depression, now I don't, yay. Do you think that that sort of diminishes... The sort of like people's recovery and the fact that depression isn't a on off experience, it's much more like convoluted in terms of its development and its recovery. So, it's the idea sorry, the idea that what might diminish somebody's recovery? Like skepticism towards suffering, which is in terms of the fact that if, in the case of depression, saying that what you learn from it is in fact just sort of justifying your... Right, sort of trying to redeem, trying to redeem somebody's yeah. suffering. Okay, great. So, four questions. Um, would you take the bereavement pill? Perhaps that's one for everybody. Um, is there an expectation that the more suffering or the longer suffering goes on, the more we ought to learn by it? Um, and there's a question about religion and suffering. Can religion justify suffering and that's the last question we've just heard okay well um it's been a it's been a long time since i've had a very sudden bereavement so um probably you would know the answer to this question my answer to this question might differ if i had just had a sudden bereavement um my 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 sense at the moment is that I wouldn't uh, take that tablet. That there is that there are fruitful experiences, uh, even in something like sudden bereavement, um, and that perhaps in bereavement as well, I might not want to because the suffering itself is something that continues to um, make one relate to the person who's died, and I think actually that that is an important thing that one, in some sense. Um, desires in bereavement um, so I'm not even sure if even if I if even if I were in 
that horrible situation. Um, I, I would want that. I, th I suspect for that reason um, I would prefer to suffer than have that bond with the person who's died taken away. Um, I don't think the length of suffering means we, we should learn more from it. Um, there are um, examples of suffering over very, very long periods of time, and precisely because they're so gradual, um, they they can be w the worst for what the amounts that we learn, I think, because because we internalize them so much, um, so because we, we accept them and take them into ourselves. And that seems to be a factor that um, stops us from learning. That's something that makes us think, well, I, I deserve this suffering because I'm not that good a person or something like that because we experience those kinds of things. Um, so I'm not sure that, that length um, <coughs> actually makes that much difference. I would consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and does religion justify suffering? I don't think any of the religious interpretations I've come across um, justify suffering. And I, I think um, if a religion isn't saying suffering is something that needs to be resisted and fought, um, as some religions do, um, or some aspects of religion do, then, then it's kind of a bad thing. We ought to question it. Danielle, would you like to help us out about any of these topics? Um, other than saying no, I wouldn't take the pill. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Good. Tom. Um, yeah, I also think I wouldn't take the pill, but I think there's a... For, 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 very, for very similar reasons to the ones that you've just heard, but I suppose I'd put it more directly, which is that um, it's not as though... Well... It's hard to separate the facts of something like a bereavement from the f f feelings of it. So one thing that sometimes people report after someone dies is numbness, so not feeling anything. And that's not reported as a good thing. It's not like, well, I'm just aware of the fact that this person has died, but I don't feel anything, and so I'm fine. It's reported as extremely distressing for reasons I think one can intuitively understand so if the pill just makes you feel numb then it's no good if the pill makes you forget that the person's died or it starts altering your beliefs well I'm not really not yeah I'm not not drawn to that one so I guess maybe I feel like the question supposes a distinction which I'm not sure I'm able to make, which is between how you feel about it and what you know about it. And that doesn't quite seem to... So, so, so yeah, I think that's why I'd say, why I'd say no. Um, I think when it came to the question about religions, I don't have a religious story about suffering at all, but I think I don't really have any good overall s story about it. And um, uh, that... Yeah, that, that's the problem, isn't it? There isn't one story about it. Um, uh, that, that, that's how it seems to me, anyway. <coughs> well, we've got about 15 minutes left, and what I want to do for the rest of the session is to try to work out how much agreement there is among the panel. It's nice to see there's some agreement on not taking the pill, so that's maybe a place to start. There's also agreement on... Um, the idea. I'd like to know yeah. who would take the pill. Oh, would, let's Peter, do a would show you take the pill? No, I wouldn't take the okay, pill. Okay, would anyone take the pill? Hands up if you'd take the pill. Do you want to tell us why? No. Yeah, if you can. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not completely for taking it, but I'm not against taking it. And I think uh, the reason is that there, I feel like there's a lot of misconception about taking medication where you think that you necessarily become numb to the feelings. And then there's the argument that you kind of need to go through the suffering for it to end. And, uh, and, and sometimes we believe that taking the pill doesn't actually let you go through the experiences and maybe you end up learning less about yourself because you're you're kind of hiding behind medication but i think that 
it's also sorry I get nervous about <laughs> public speaking uh, <laughs> why did I raise my hand <laughs> so um, so I think it's important to recognize that sometimes uh, medication doesn't completely numb you but it helps you deal with the suffering in a healthier way so perhaps you, you'll be able to think about the problem differently. And, and something, something I noticed uh, from having gone through some episodes of depression is that sometimes happiness feels like a distraction, but you can also learn from it. Because once you recognize the pattern, you're able to kind of apply it when, you, when you're feeling down again. So I think that if taking the pill can teach you something for a period of time, even if you end up stopping the pill and kind of feeling some suffering, you might learn a way, you, or you, you might learn some technique on how to reflect on your pain that you might not have learned without the pill. Because we need to take into consideration that sometimes the, it's too overwhelming, you know, and you, and you don't know where you can end up in the spiral. So I don't know where I'd be if I was in that situation, but I, I don't like completely going against something. I think pills are here for a reason, and if they would help you reflect better and not necessarily numb you, then they're important. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. <laughs> Maybe if we did the vote again, we might have a different <laughs> opinion after that. Yeah. yeah. So there's some, at least until you spoke, there's some agreement that you wouldn't take the pill. There's some agreement, I think, therefore, that you can learn from suffering, and suffering can, in some sense, I don't know if I would say, n maybe not valuable, but meaningful. <coughs> um, and also, there's some agreement that it isn't the case that you ought to learn from suffering. Is there, are there other areas of agreement, or perhaps areas of disagreement uh, among you? <coughs> I think we were sort of still slightly disagreeing about the um, about the the possibility of having a attributing moral responsibility. You were saying that actually could be quite a, help, a helpful thing, perhaps to some people in some contexts. Uh, or well, am I well um, uh, so it, one uh, one question would be. Are you justified in treating two different people differently if you think there is a responsibility? Mm -hmm. I, w I wouldn't say a moral responsibility, but if it's pretty clear that one person has done something which has led to it knowingly and the other one hasn't. Now, I don't mean that you know doctors should withhold treatment or that we should be nasty to them or something like that, but that our attitude towards those people would be different doesn't seem to me to be intrinsically like implausible. Um, a, a second part of that conversation, I suppose, was um, how ha how psychologically helpful for the individual is it to have a story whereby they've caused their own suffering? And there, I, I, I didn't take it that we were disagreeing. I guess I, I thought that maybe it would vary case to case, mm -hmm. but I could imagine it going either way quite plausibly. I could imagine somebody being told a, 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 a plausible story and that made them feel better. I could imagine somebody being told, no, there's no story. Mm -hmm. and that making them feel better. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah. So, but I, I didn't sense that we disagreed about that. But perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm um, wrong. So, so I think I think I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> I was I, you're disagreeing both with me and with my summary of whether or not we disagreed. <laughs> that is two for the price of one on disagreements. Well, well no, I'm only disagreeing with the first of those things. Oh, OK, right. <laughs> but maybe we didn't disagree at the time, but, but I think... Um, so I... I, I <laughs> maybe we did. Ah. Um, it doesn't seem to me that... It seems to me... I mean, people who put forward the kind of the sin explanation for, for people with, or some people with depression, um, sometimes they'll say, well, with some people it's a chemical imbalance, but with some people they're just sinful and they've done these things wrong. Um, it seems to me that they're saying, actually, this is, a, this is a hopeful account because we're telling you that it's been caused by this bad thing, but that's good news because then you can do something about it. So that's, that's bringing some kind of hope to the situation, whereas as they would say, the, the kind of medical account that just talks about um, uh, having, having a, 
having something wrong with your your brain or your body that makes you depressed, they say that that doesn't give people enough hope that something can can be done in response to this. So that, so they do say, well, we've got this psychologically pastorally helpful kind of motivation behind this. Um, but I think when you then look at, at accounts of people who've been told this as, as an explanation for their depression or been told the kind of secular equivalent um, that they've been immoral rather than sinful, say, um, that seems to that seems to be unhelpful because although it does give a certain kind of hope and it gives a certain kind of meaning, um, it gives them one that places an extra burden on them and particularly if if feelings of if their self esteem is low or if they already feel pretty kind of rubbish about themselves then that seems to that seems to intensify that at least in the context of, of depression. Um, I guess I guess we might want to consider this differently in different contexts. Um. Does it make a difference to you, Tom, if the story is true? So I'm imagining, perhaps it's not the right kind of case, but I'm imagining somebody who has some suffering that's been inflicted upon them. And you might think, well, their life will go better if we tell them a story about this or if they believe a story mm. about this. Mm. Um, you mentioned the athlete. You know, they've been exercising the mm. night before or something mm. like that mm. or something else uh, has happened. Uh, but really this suffering has been inflicted upon them. Um, there it seems to make a good deal of difference to me that the story is true. Uh, and, and, and it ought to matter that, that, that they believe the true story rather than another story, even if, even if believing the other story would make things go better. Well, let me put it this way. We, so, I, you know, m m the view I've been putting forward is um, sometimes it's good to have a story and sometimes it's bad to have a story and sometimes it's good if the story is true and sometimes it's you know, good if the story is false and, and it seems like case by case. Um, we're only disagreeing if... Um, it's never true that having one of these kinds of false stories is good for you. So we're only disagreeing if, in all cases, or you're talking about cases of depression, about which uh, and, and I know much less than you do, so, you know, by all means, it might be true that there's no case where somebody could be told you're depressed and here's why it's for these reasons. I, I certainly wouldn't disagree that that could sometimes be very harmful to be told it's your fault when it isn't. But... I'm also very persuaded by the idea that um, completely false uh, stories about ourselves can be very helpful, um, or uh, accounts of why we've done things and how we've done things that have led to this situation, even though they aren't true, can be extremely helpful. I, 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 it's very hard for me to rule that out in advance. I mean, to take a case that's not depression, to take a sort of literary example, I guess, if that maybe helps, to... The, there's a, the, you know, in one of Ibsen's plays, The Wild Duck, there's somebody who's a doctor and his medications are telling people what he calls life lies, which is to say he tells people that, 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 that he tells people stories about their lives which are false but which then make them feel better. So one of them thinks that he's, he's working on an invention that's going to change the world. Now, it's pretty obvious that he isn't working on an invention that's going to change the world, but it gives him something to do. And, it, and when, he, when the evenings come, he has to go upstairs to work on his invention. And, of course, we all know it's not true, but the, 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 the content of the play is definitely not unambiguously it would be really good if none of us had these things. Um, the content of the play is... It's a little bit worrying that it looks a lot like it would be good for us if we did have these things. And so if we disagree, it would only be if you're saying that there's no such thing as a life flight when it comes to depression. And I don't know enough about depression to know whether that's true or false. My instinct is that, of course, there could be some, even if they're not the examples that you've given. But, mm -hmm. So may maybe that's the question. Could there be, could there be a helpful... Uh, false stories 
talk about depression? So I think there could be helpful false stories. What I'm not convinced about is that the helpful false stories could be one where the responsibility is laid at the the foot of the person who's experiencing it. Okay. That that's my my point of disagreement. Um, going back to the idea of helpful true stories, so the the philosopher of psychiatry Lisa Bortolotti uh, has this great piece on uh, delusions and how delusions serve a kind of epistemic function in terms of helping us to um, know things that that we might not otherwise know, even though they're delusions, um, which which seems um, quite quite extraordinary. But for example. Um, there's a guy who's had this horrible accident and he believes for months on end that his girlfriend, who in fact has dumped him, uh, has actually married him uh, and, they, and he keeps talking about what a great sex life they're having uh, and he's very, very happy about it. And the, the doctors are sort of talking about, well, this, is, this seems to be this, this kind of delusion um, and try to disabuse him of it. Uh, but when things get better for him, when he's kind of healthier and um, back on his feet again, he, he just stops having this delusion so it seems that he needed this delusion in order to keep him going at the time um, and that seemed to be serving a kind of function in his life um, so that seems to be a case where there can be a false story but but it's a helpful story um, what I'm not convinced about is that any of the kind of um, this this happened because you did this thing or because you thought this thing or whatever um, is ever going to be a helpful story to tell. Whether true or false. Whether true or false, yeah. With respect to depression or in general? I'm going to hedge my bets and say with respect to depression. <laughs> <laughs> because even then it's quite a strong, quite a strong claim. We thought yeah. you were making the strong claim, Tom, in the beginning, but actually maybe it wasn't ah, so. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think... We had better draw matters to a close. It's uh, nearly eight, and I think if we try to fit in some more questions, we're going to run uh, way over time. Thanks to everyone who came and who asked the question, and to our panel.